Yo, what's up guys? Alpha, and today I'm going to be doing a new installment in the Under the Meta series where I go over a deck I've been working on that I definitely think is strong and has a lot of potential, but isn't quite tier 1 for whatever reason. So I'm going to break down the deck, talk about its strengths and weaknesses, how it could potentially be improved in future, and then we've got some gameplay at the end so you guys can see the deck in action as well. So anyway, this episode I'm going to be covering 5 colour Crucius Niv in Historic. So if you're not familiar with 5 colour Niv, it's basically a 5 colour control deck that's built around this card, Niv Mizzet Reborn. So this is a 5 mana 6-6, six, six, cost 1 mana of each colour, and when it enters the battlefield, you reveal the top 10 cards of your library. For each colour pair, you choose a card that's exactly those colours from among them, put the chosen cards into your hand, and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So, the idea with the Niv deck is that you run the best quality two colour interaction you can to just try and stabilise in the early game, and then once you hit 5 mana, you can cast the Niv, which will hopefully refuel your hand, and then a 6-6 six, six flying body is obviously really huge, so it also acts as a way to close the game out in a win condition in and of itself as well, which is really sick. So, the first thing to note about Niv, when you read this, you might think that you want to be running cards in every colour pair to maximise the amount of cards you draw off Niv, but that's really not the case. I think it's more important to be running good quality two colour cards, and because you're pretty happy if you hit two or more cards off this, you don't need to be drawing like five or six cards for this to win you the game. And if you do end up running subpar cards just to run cards in every colour pair, you're going to end up in situations where you're not able to stabilise and actually get to a point where you can cast the Niv. So I think, like I said, it's more important to not run cards in every colour pair and just focus on running good quality stuff so that you maximise your chances of reaching the Niv. Um, another really great addition to the deck is Crucius. So as I'm on a trend at the moment of basically trying Crucius in every historic deck that I can. I think this is definitely one of the best homes for Crucius for a number of reasons. So first of all, the great thing about Crucius in this particular deck is it enables you to tutor and ramp into Niv on turn 4 because if you go Crucius on turn 3 and you discard a 3 drop, not only do you tutor Niv because it's the only card in the deck that costs more than 3, you also make a treasure token so that you can ramp into Niv on turn 4 and this curve out is so strong and can win against most of the decks in the format. The other really nice thing about Crucius at the other end of the deck is that it can also be used to tutor for lands because because if you look, we don't have anything below 2 mana, so you know, chances are we're going to have hands where we have a lot of 2 mana cards. So if we end up having, you know, play our 3rd land, play Crucius, if we don't have our 4th land, we can just discard one of our 2 drops and choose Expedient to guarantee a land drop. Now we are running 28 lands in the deck because this is definitely a deck where you want to be curving out until your 5th land in basically every single game. So the fact that Crucius can find you Niv if you already have lands and find you land drops if you don't is so powerful. Uh, in addition to that, the fact that it creates treasures really helps to address two of the big issues of the deck and that is, well, I guess the main issue with the deck for me in the past has been that mana is a real choke point in this deck and what I mean by that is that oftentimes when you win with uh, sorry oftentimes when you lose with Niv you'll lose with a bunch of spells in your hand that you weren't able to cast either because you didn't have enough mana or because you didn't have mana of the right colour and the fact that Crucius can repeatedly make treasure tokens really helps to fix both of those issues because it ramps so it enables you to cast multiple spells in the same turn and obviously treasures can produce mana of any colour as well so if you're missing a particular colour Crucius can help fix your mana there as well so Crucius is such a great addition to the deck. Uh, additionally, you know, comparing it to something like Widespread Thieving, which is a card that I've run in the past, Crucius is just so much better than that because it commits to the board, which can help you stabilise against other decks. And it's also two colours, so you can also hit it off Niv. So I think Crucius is such a great addition to the deck, and it really helps to fix a lot of the issues that Niv decks have had in the past. Uh, in addition to Niv and Crucius, we've also got Territorial Carvu as another threat. So Oftentimes this is just going to be a 2 mana 5-5 five, five because we have a bunch of Triumphs and Shocklands in the deck, so getting Domain online for this is pretty easy in a lot of situations. And then both of the attack triggers on this are really nice, you know, the ability to discard and draw, essentially loot away dead cards, really helps you to dig for land drops, ditch dead cards for better ones, and the fact it also has incidental graveyard hate on it is really, really sick as well. So Carvu, another really nice option to be in Niv. Then in terms of the other spells in the deck, we've got Expressive Iteration, which is obviously one of the best cards in the format. Really nice in this particular deck because, like I said, hitting land drops consistently is very important, so being able to cast iteration in the early turns to make sure that you keep hitting lands is very important. And then obviously, you know, if you need specific types of interaction, it can help you dig for that. If you're already at parity, it can help you find Niv to start pulling ahead. So iteration, really, really great card, obviously. And then in terms of interaction, Four Lightning Helix is another card that is very important in the deck. You know, can kill early creatures against the opponent, but the fact that this gains you life back is very important right now. We are having to run a decent number of shock lands to enable the five color mana base, and there are a lot of aggro decks that like to pressure your life total, stuff like wizards and humans, and I've seen a lot of burn decks around recently as well, so 
The three life gain off this is really, really huge at helping you stabilize. Then we've also got four copies of Assassin's Trophy, so I'm really high on this card, and I think it's very important in this particular deck to have answers to every type of problematic permanent, because if you're not running something like Assassin's Trophy, you can be very vulnerable to artifacts and enchantments that produce value over the course of the game, and Planeswalkers as well, because you are quite a threat like deck, so if you are against a deck like Blue-White Control, and the opponent sticks a Teferi, it can be very difficult to kill that if you don't already have a Niv or Crucius or Carvu in play, so having trophies a way to immediately kill that is really nice. Now obviously the downside of it is it does ramp the opponent but that's not really much of an issue unless you're playing it exactly on turn 2 so I feel like trophy is very important in this deck at making sure that you're not vulnerable to any particular card types like artifacts or enchantments that you would be very vulnerable to otherwise. Then we've also got two copies of Drown in the Lock so this is really nice because it can act as a counter spell which we don't really have access to main deck outside of this. Very important against cards like Muxus that can just snowball the game if you don't have it and it can also act as a removal spell for bigger creatures as the game goes on. I definitely think two copies is the right amount for this, you know, it's a card that is phenomenal as the game goes on, but it can be very awkward in the early game if the opponent doesn't have anything in the graveyard, you know, particularly against aggro decks, we do need to start filling their graveyard for this to go online, and the, the issue with running like three or four Drown in the Locks is you can be in situations against aggro decks where you have Drown in the Lock in your hand, but the opponent has a completely empty graveyard, so it's essentially not doing anything, so I think two is the right number for this, and it's felt pretty good as it is. Then we've also got a single copy of Croxus, so this is here as kind of a consideration to the fact that Niv is quite a threat light deck. I've had issues in the past in builds where, you know, I was just running for four Niv, four Carvu, Gigantha as the only threats in the deck. Obviously, Crucius helps with that a little bit, but against decks that are running a lot of single target removal, you can be left in situations where you're really head on card advantage and you have a bunch of spells in your hand, but the opponent is able to just kill your Niv and kill your Carvu so you don't actually have anything to pressure the opponent with. So I feel it's important to have a card like Croxer in the deck so that you have a way to, you know, you have a threat that is recurrable that even if the opponent does have a lot of single target removal, you can just keep bringing it back over and over again. Now in the past, I used to run a card like Scarab God, particularly in Explorer, but in this particular deck, you don't really want to be running a Scarab God because you don't want to be running anything that costs more than three mana that isn't Niv or Crucius doesn't consistently tutor it. And honestly, in this deck, I think Crocs is better than Scarab World anyway, because we have so many ways to discard. You know, we've got Crucius and Carvey that both discard very regularly. So not only can we discard the Crocs off these cards, but we can also fill our graveyard very quickly to allow us to escape the Crocs as well. So I feel like this is very important. Then at the three drop slot, we've also got four copies of Deafening Clarion. So I feel like this is very important, first of all, because all of the interaction in the deck is single target removal, which can leave you very vulnerable to the more go wide aggro decks like humans and elves and merfolk and goblins, for example. So having Full Clarion maximizes your chances of stabilizing in those matchups, which is very important. And additionally, I feel in this particular build, because we have Crucius, it's important to be running slightly more three drops just so we can consistently go turn three Crucius, pitch a three drop to chew to the Niv. And additionally, you know, the issue with running Full Clarion in the past is that it can be an awkward card against, you know, control decks and other, you know, combo decks, for example. But because we have Crucius in addition to Carvu as a way to discard it if it's not good, that's not really much of an issue. And then we've also got a single copy of Kurligan's Command, so I think this is a card where the first copy is very valuable. You know, this is another card that helps to fix some of the issues of Niv being a threat light -like deck because you can use Culligan's Command to rebuy your Nivs or Carvies from the graveyard. Also gives you main deck ways to kill artifacts, which is nice. And just generally, you know, it's a very flexible card. And the first copy is really nice to see, but you never really want to draw it in multiples. So I really like it as a one-off. Then we do also get access to Gigantha as the companion. Typically, Gigantha isn't that powerful in a lot of decks. It's kind of just a free card. But in this particular deck, it is very useful because of the mana ability. If we get Gigantha in play, we can tap it to essentially cast Niv for free, which then allows us to have all of our mana off our lands available to cast whatever we hit off Niv. So Gigantha allowing us to cast Niv for free and another way to, for us to just fix our mana in general is very nice. And then in terms of the mana base, like I said, 28 lands is very important because you want to be curving out into at least your fourth or fifth land every single game. Um, the mana base is definitely the biggest weakness of this deck in general. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more once I've gone through the sideboard, but Overall, to enable us to consistently have all five colours, we need to run a bunch of Triomes, a bunch of Shock Lands, and then I also like running Check Lands in this deck because they're consistently enabled by the Triomes and the Shock Lands as well. You don't really want to be running too many Shock Lands because you know, the deck can get off to a slightly slower start because of the Triomes, and dealing yourself damage makes you more vulnerable to the aggro deck, so check lands is really nice here. I like the single basic as well because your deck will be super vulnerable to Field of Ruin or Assassin's Trophy if you don't have it, and then Mana Confluence is a really nice addition to help fix mana as well. The reason I'm not running more is because, like I said, you don't want to deal yourself too much damage off your mana base, otherwise 
you know, you can be in, stuck in issues where the opponent just burns you out with a deck like Wizards or Burn. Now, Helix does obviously help with that. As, you know, another thing I didn't mention about Clarion is that it gives your big creatures lifelink as well. So if you have like a Niv or Carvu or Gigantha, you can swing back to gain a bunch of life as well. But you're not always going to have these cards. You're not always going to have a creature in play when you play the Clarion. So you don't want to be dealing yourself too much damage off the Mana Confluence. And additionally, it doesn't uh, enable Domain for Carvu either. So if you run too many Mana Confluence, you can be left with opening hands where you do yourself a lot of damage off the Confluence. And Carvu is stuck as like a 3-3 three, three or something. So I think two Mana Confluence has felt like a good amount overall. So that's the main deck. Like I said, I think Crucius is such a great addition to this deck. And honestly, this is one of the best Crucius decks I've played because the interaction with Niv is so powerful. And just fixing your hand and making treasures is something that this deck has definitely wanted in the past. Uh, then in terms of the sideboard, two copies of Rest in Peace is Graveyard Hate. So there's a big selection of Graveyard Hate you can run in Niv. There isn't really any good quality two-color Graveyard Hate. You know, there's Consecrate Consume, but I don't think that's really worth playing. So out of all the Graveyard Hate, I definitely prefer Rest in Peace just because... The matchups where Graveyard Hate is relevant, Rest in Peace is just significantly better than something like an Unlicensed Hearse or, you know, Tormod's Crypt or Soul Guide Lantern because it shuts everything off. Now, if you do bring in Rest in Peace, it does probably mean that you need to cut Crocs and Drown in the Lock, but like I said, in the matchups where we want this, this is such a bar against them. Stuff like Phoenix, stuff like uh, Kethis Combo, stuff like Underworld Breach, so I really like Rest in Peace uh, because it just completely shuts off a lot of those decks. Then we've got four copies of Dovin's Veto and four copies of Siphon Insight for the control match. Up. So Dovin's Veto is kind of self-explanatory in the control matchup. It's two colours so we can hit it off Niv, and it's just the best counter spell that winning counter wars in that matchup. Um, then Siphon Insight might need a little bit more explanation, but I definitely think that this is the best card in addition to Dovin's Veto in the control matchup. So if we look at the main deck, we do have a lot of cards that are basically dead in the control matchup, so definitely Clarion is pretty bad. Lightning Helix isn't awful, but you do want to cut it. It's not very high impact in general, so in the control matchups, I do want eight cards to be bringing in for the four Deafening Clarion, four Lightning Helix. And I think Siphon Insight is definitely the best uh, addition because outside of Davin's Veto, the only real cards that you want to be running in the control matchup are either more counter spells, which I'm not particularly high on. You know, Mystical Dispute is fine in the matchup, but you do then end up cutting two color cards from your deck. So Niv is slightly less impactful if you do get to resolve it. Uh, Planeswalkers, which are so difficult to resolve in the mirror match. You know, typically control will be boarding in more counter spells against you, particularly their own mystical dispute, because dispute can counter Niv for one mana. And so it's so difficult to ever resolve a planeswalker against control, particularly if you're going second. So I've not really had much success with planeswalkers in that matchup. And then the other option you've got is discard spells. Now, Thought Erasure is a two color option, but I think if you're going to run discard spells, you're better off just running Thought Seize. My big issue with running discard spells in this particular deck is for discard spells to be effective, you need to be applying pressure alongside it. And a lot of draws in this deck, you won't be able to do that because you don't have that many threats. So I don't think discard spells are particularly th that great because the opponent you just give your opponent too much time to draw out of it, if that makes sense. Whereas Siphon Insight is so nice because because we're quite a threat-like deck, most of the time against control, both players are just going draw go for the most part. And having, you know, going draw go when you have counter spells open and siphon insight is really huge because if the opponent doesn't do anything, you can just siphon insight and hit. If you hit planeswalkers or counter spells, that is such a good or, or I guess lands as well if you need to hit land drops. But that's so powerful in the matchup and it's so much more difficult for them to stop than Planeswalkers. You know, the issue with running Planeswalkers like Teferi or, you know, K uh, Kaito Shizuki, for example, is that they're very easy for the opponent to counter. Whereas Siphon Insight is really difficult for the opponent to counter because you're going to be doing it at the end of their turn. So if they do end up countering it, that means they have less mana up to stop stuff during your turn. And additionally, because it has flashback, you get to activate it again anyway. So Siphon Insight, I really like in the matchup because I found control versus Niv. Both players go draw go a lot and Siphon Insight really allows you to pull ahead and especially if the opponent doesn't have anything else to be able to counter or interact with, if that makes sense. So I really like 4 Veto 4 Insight to enable you to pivot against control because keeping Helix in against control really isn't that great. You know, at best, you're going to be using it to pick Planeswalkers or Wandering Ember tokens off. And, you know, that is a two for one against you. So I'm not a big fan of keeping Helix in against control. And then we've also got two copies of Tyrant Scorn as additional single target removal for matchups where that's relevant. You know, particularly against the fast aggro decks, you kind of want to be cutting Coligan's Command and Croxer because they're quite slow. So swapping them out for two Tyrant Scorn against the decks like Wizards is really nice. And we've also got two copies of Culling Ritual. So I'm really high on this card in general. It's very good against the Affinity decks and Thopter's decks. 
because a bunch of their early permanents just get completely destroyed by this. It's also very good against a deck like Auras as well, so... I'm a really big fan of Culling Ritual against both the artifact decks and decks that are full of cheap creatures as well. You know, particularly against Doctors, this is a complete blowout as well. So that's the deck overall. I think Crucius does help to fix a ton of the issues that the decks had, but basically the only and big weakness of this deck is the mana base. You know, to consistently have all five colours, you're having to run a ton of Triomes, which is, you know, very slow, particularly if you're going second. And, you know, even though we are running a ton of Triomes and Shocklands and Checklands, you're still going to sometimes end up in situations where you don't have the right colours of mana, or you just don't have the right colours of mana to cast the two spells that you need to cast. So... I'm not really sure what the fix is for this, honestly, because we already have Mana Confluence, which is one of the cards that the Pioneer Niv decks had that we don't. And without Fetchlands, I don't really think there's a better way to improve the mana base in this deck. Now, I'm not saying it's always an issue. You know, for the vast majority of games, you're going to be fine. And when the mana base does cooperate, I do think this is definitely, like, up there in terms of power level in the format. You know, it's able to compete with all the Tier 1 decks when your mana base does cooperate. But, you know, every five or six games, you're just going to have a game where the mana base doesn't cooperate. And there's not really much you can do about that. So... I definitely think this is a powerful deck, but I think the thing that's holding it back from being tier 1 is just the inconsistent mana base. If you guys can think of a way to fix it, definitely let me know in the comments because this deck has been so much fun to play. I really enjoy playing it, but I don't feel that I can consistently win with Niv. But first of all, because I feel like the format is quite fast as well. There are a lot of fast decks in the format which punish you for stumbling on mana. If the format was very mid-range focused and there weren't too many aggro decks, I don't think this would be as much of an issue. But considering, you know, Wizards, Humans, Thopters, Goblins... I guess Goblins is a little slower, but there are a lot of very fast aggro decks that punish you for stumbling on mana. So you are just going to end up losing some games to having a slow start, not hitting the right mana, not hitting the right colours of mana, which is definitely what I feel like holds this deck back from being tier 1. So if you guys have any solutions to that problem, definitely let me know in the comments. Uh, outside of that, the deck is so much fun to play. And like I said, I think Crucius helps to fix a lot of the other problems in the deck that don't involve the mana base. So... I'm definitely going to keep playing with this deck and see if I can tweak it any further. But yeah, it's so much fun to play. Um, and I definitely think it's almost tier 1 if we can fix the mana base issues in this deck. So anyway, next up, I've run this deck through a uh, constructed event. So I've just got four matches from that so you guys can see the deck in action. If you've got any questions or comments about the deck at all, definitely let me know in the comments section below. And I hope you enjoy the gameplay. Big up. Okay, sweet. Here we go. Okay, so we're on the play here. And yeah, this hand looks sick. So we get to play Carvio on turn two as a 4-4. Into Crucius on three, potentially pitching the Clarion to tutor Niv for Niv on turn four. So this, yeah, this hand is sick. Okay, so opponent plays Den of the Bugbear and Goblin Arsonist. Okay, interesting. So I'm not sure what we're up against here. Could be Goblins, could be Mono Reds. Um, okay, it's Gruel. Interesting. Oh, okay. So, yeah, okay. So, we're probably against Shamans here, then. Golden Arsonist is interesting. I, I mean, I guess one of the issues with Shamans as a deck is that they didn't really have good one-drops. And I guess the... Um, what's it called? Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to think whether I want to loot here or not. Honestly, I'm not sure we do, because I think we want to play Crucius and discard the Clarion. Clarion is going to be great against Shamans anyway. So I want to keep hold of one, and I don't really want to pitch this Carvu either, because I think this will be good in the matchup. But yeah, uh, Shamans doesn't really have great one-drops, and um, they also have Harmonic Prodigy, so you do get to double up the death triggers on Goblin Arsonist if it dies. So I guess, you know, I that kind of makes sense. I could see why they're running it. But yeah, either way, we've already got the fourth land, so we can just cast Niv next turn. Okay, they got Realm War Crushing, they named Shaman. Yeah, okay. But yeah, we should just be good to win here. I, I very much doubt, you know, we're so far ahead on board anyway, and getting a, a turn four Niv down is going to be so sick here. So let's see what we hit. Wow, we hit four, and those are pr four pretty good cards as well. So I think we can afford to attack with both. I don't really mind losing the Crucius here. I just want to start applying as much pressure as possible. And I think we can probably afford... Hmm... Okay, I mean, I was thinking about discarding the Iteration because we already have so many cards in hand anyway. So this matchup, I mean, I think, you know, Culling Ritual could be good, but they also do have a decent number of powerful three drops. So 
unlike a matchup like, you know, Auras or Affinity, I'm not sure. I think we're just more interested in single target removal. So I think I'll cut the Culligan's Command here because that's a little inefficient for this sort of matchup. We just want to kill their early creatures as quickly as possible. And then I can see cutting, you know, maybe an Assassin's Trophy or a Croxa here. I'm just trying to debate which is more important. Probably going to cut the trophy because Croxa could be valuable if the game does go long. You know, they, they unlike a lot of other aggro decks, they do have ways to draw out. You know, they've got Season Pyromancer, they've got uh, potentially Faceless Agent and Elvish Visionary. So they do potentially have ways to draw out of our sweepers, for example. So, and also they don't really have that many cards that are like peculiar card types that trophies that much better than any of the other removal against. Okay, they got Prodigy on two. I mean, thankfully we have Deafening Clarion here, so hopefully we just go, you know, they'll just play a few creatures, we can just untap and, and Clarion. Now, it would be annoying if they... I, I, I guess Rage Forger doesn't put the Harmonic Prodigy out of range because the Prodigy itself isn't a Shaman. Oh, wow, okay, they got Burning Tree, that makes four mana. Wow, and Company. Okay, so that's fine. As, as long as they don't have Rage Forger, I think we should be fine here. If they have Rage Forger, they get to put both of these Burning Trees out of range of the Deafening Clarion, which would be really rough here. But if they don't, we, you know, Clarion should just be good to sweep up the whole board here. Okay, Goblin Arsonist, that's fine. Oh, they do have the Rage Forger. Yikes, okay. So this is going to be a lot harder to win now. You know, we can kill everything other than the Burning Tree Embassies, but we have to put us down to 16 to shock in the land here. And we take two off the Goblin Arsonist dying as well. At least I assume we take two. Maybe we don't because the Prodigies died. Oh no, okay, we do, we do take two off the Arsonist. So we're going down to 14 here, and then we're taking eight from the Burning Tree attacks. And the Clarions don't kill them either, so... Oh, wow. And they have another Rage Forger. Okay, so we're basically just dead here. I, I don't think there's anything in the deck that can save us. So that was kind of unfortunate. Like, we, the opponent had an incredibly strong hand. And had they not had Rage Forger, even with a fast start, I think we probably would have had a chance if we could clarry in their board there. But that's a bit unfortunate. And also, you know, I think we would have been fine if we were on the play there, potentially. Although we probably wouldn't have used Clarion just to kill the um, Prodigy. So... Just got to hope they have a less powerful draw. And we're going first in this game as well. So hopefully things should be a little easier this game. So let's see what we start with here. Ha. Huh. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of this hand because of the mana confluence and because we only have two lands as well. This I'm happier with. So I definitely want to keep the Carver and the Clarion. And we kind of want to keep the Niv here as well. So I might just put a land back. You know, the really nice thing about running 28 lands is you are quite likely to keep curving out to your 4th and 5th land drop. Which is why, you know, keeping a 3 lander is a lot more safe than a 2 lander on the play with this deck. So, plus having one of your 2 lands as mana confluence is going to deal you a lot of damage. And Shamans is a deck that they can deal direct damage off stuff like Rage Forger, even if we do have big creatures in play. So... I do want to be careful about my life total in this matchup, so going to lead on the Ketria Triumph here and just see what the opponent has. Hopefully they don't have a turn one elf. Okay, tap land, perfect. So now we get to play Carvu, and it's a 4-4 four, four straight away, which is really nice. And we drew another land, so assuming we can draw another land, then we can potentially cast Niv on turn 5, which is, you know, obviously going to be the goal here. Okay, Visionary on 2 is great, you know, that's a lot slower start from the opponent. So, we're going to attack here, and I'm not sure if we really want to discard anything, to be honest. I'm going to play the land pre-combat just so we um, turn Carver into a 5-5. Five five. I mean, maybe that was a mistake. So, initially, I wasn't going to loot because I kind of want to make sure I have a fifth land for the Niv. But because I chose to loot, I think it probably would have been better for me to not play a land just because we did end up drawing a Triome. Okay, interesting. So, we drew a Helix here. So I think I'm just going to Helix the Anarchomancer and attack with the Carvu. I mean, maybe, it, maybe it's better to... Um, maybe it's better to attack first, but I very much doubt they're going to block with the Anarchomancer, so I don't think that would make a difference. And to be honest, thinking about it, I don't think I should have actually exiled that Anarchomancer from the graveyard because that means that Drown in the Lock is less likely to be turned on. Okay, they got company. Okay, they basically whiffed on the company, which is great for us. But yeah... 
I think I should have not exiled the Anarchomancer because Shamans doesn't have any graveyard interaction as far as I'm aware. So we probably should have just left that. Okay, opponent just scoops it up. We got there. Nice. Okay, so we're going first here. And her. I mean, two mana confluence and five lands. Probably going to mull this. Okay, this looks a lot better. So we potentially got Carvey on two. Potentially got Crucius into ramping into Niv on turn three as well. Well, not as well. With the current land situation, we'd need to pick which one to go for. But either way, I definitely think this is going to be a keep. And... Probably put back a Crucius, not 100% sure. So opponents deciding on their mulligan. But yeah, I mean, with this hand, I think, you know, unless the opponent is playing like a really fast aggro deck, like if they're playing Wizards or something like that, then I think I would be more interested in saving the untapped land until turn three for Crucius so that we can potentially go turn four Niv because we can, you know, we can go Crucius. Discard Clarion, pick Ambitious, get a get a treasure token, and guarantee the Niv for turn four, which seems pretty sick. Okay, so opponent's taking a while with their Mulligan decision, but yeah, I mean, I'm pretty happy with this hand overall. And, you know, we are missing blue, which does mean that Carvey is going to be stuck at a 4-4 for a little while, but we will get blue mana off the treasure, so yeah, going to put back the Crucius here, lead on the Savoy Triome, and see what the opponent's up to. Okay, Temple of Malice Tap. So with, unless we draw an untapped land here, I think we'll definitely go for the, the Triome. And then we can go for Crucius on three. Now, if we don't draw a fourth land, that could be a bit annoying. We could potentially use Crucius to guarantee a land by discarding one of the two drops. But I think it's more important to just chew to the Niv here. So this is close between Carvu and Trophy to discard. Maybe discarding the Trophy is a bit sketch because now we don't actually have a way to kill Croxer if they do escape it but I mean that's so far off in the future that I don't think it's really worth considering yet so just going to pitch the Clarion here and find Niv and you know it is a bit awkward with expressive iteration here so I'm really hoping we draw a fourth land okay perfect so now we can just slam the Niv which is sick if not we would have either had to go for Carvu or burn our treasure to use expressive iteration but you know with ha oh, interesting so do we want Clarion? I mean, so I assume we're against Rakdos mid-range here, and we don't really want Clarion to kill Crucius here, to be honest. So I think I'm going to go for the Helix here, just as a way to kill the Reflection. And then... Pitching Expressive Iteration doesn't seem great against Rakdos, but we don't have any blue mana currently, so... I think I'm just going to pitch the Iteration and, you know, keep the Carvus, because even though the Carvus do die to Fatal Push... If we can get one in play before they escape Croc, so we can attack to exile it. So that seems pretty important. Huh, so they only they only have three cards in the graveyard right now, but they do have Liliana, which I assume okay, they, they minus the Liliana makes sense. Even though we've got another Niv in hand, I think I'm gonna sack the Crucius here. Just because next turn I do want to try and get Carvus into play. Okay, interesting. We draw Drown in the Log. Now, maybe there's an argument to keeping Crucius around so that we, and that just playing the Niv from hand, but with that Croxer in Graveyard, I do kind of want to get the Carvus in play, and I think I'm just going to pass here. You know, holding up Helix is important to be able to kill the Reflection, and we've also got Drown in the Lock as a way to counter whatever they play. Now, if they can get two cards in the Graveyard, they can escape the Croxer, which turns the Drown in the Lock off, but Hopefully that shouldn't end up mattering. Okay. So we could counter the Trespasser here, but I don't think I'm really that concerned about it, to be honest, with a Niv and a Carvu in play. So I think I'm just going to Helix the Reflection at the end of, my t at the, end of the opponent's turn here. And then we can... Ha, ah, okay. So they kill the Carvu. So now if we, if we Lightning Helix the Reflection, that does mean that they can escape Croxon next turn, which is a bit of an issue. Okay, we draw land. So definitely going to attack here. We want to start applying pressure and trying to close the game out here. And then I think I'm just going to uh, go for the, the Carvu. And then even if the opponent does escape the Croxer, 
we can still use the drown in the lock to kill the two two, or we can just oh, I, oh no wait, we have to discard the drown in the lock to the croc sir. Because we don't want to lose the Niv in hand. So maybe it would have been better to cast the Niv last turn rather than the Carvu. But, I mean, to be honest, as long as the opponent doesn't have Thought Seize here, then I'm not really too fussed. We can just go discard the Drown in the Lock, attack with the Niv, put them down to four, play the second Niv to refuel while they're attacking. So I assume that means they've probably got Stomp. Oh, they wait, they've... Oh yeah, they, they, they create a treasure token, so I assume we see Stump here as a way to kill the Carvu, but I'm not too fussed about that. We'll still put them down to five. Oh, well, they don't have it. Interesting. So I think I'll just attack with the Niv here, and then just cast the second one. Again, there's a chance that I probably should have done this last turn, but thankfully it didn't end up making a difference because they didn't have the Thought Seize. Okay, nice. So now we have an answer to the Croxer if we need it. I mean, we could still block with the, the Carvu, but we're not too worried about our life total here. We can discard the Crocs to their Crocs attack, and then we definitely don't want to block with the Niv because, you know, the opponent's dead on board here. And generally, Rakdos Midrange doesn't actually run anyways in the main deck to be able to kill Niv, so... I think we should be good here. You know, they can attack with the Crocs, but we'll just let it through. We can discard our own Crocs to escape next turn. So yeah, we should be good. So I think I might have misplayed. Maybe I'm supposed to play the second Niv before the Carvey because that Drown in the Lock wasn't very useful because we knew they were going to escape the Crocs straight away. Uh, in this matchup against Rakdos Midrange, I think the main deck's very well set up against them. I don't think there's anything in the sideboard that we particularly want. You know, we do have Rest in Pieces, Graveyard Hate, but we also have our own Croxer. And, you know, if they were running Arcanist, then I would definitely consider bringing Rest in Peace. But Rakdos Midrange, if they're running... My build that I put out recently, that's only running a single Croxer, and we're also only running a single Croxer, and the only other graveyard interaction they've got is Season Pyromancer, which we're really not worried about them getting 1-1 tokens from the graveyard, so overall I think, you know, just running it back should be good. And overall, I, I think this this matchup should be pretty good for us because we have so many good top decks and ways to refuel and we have a ton of lands which is really important so against Rakdos you basically never want to mulligan if you can avoid it. Now this hand is a little bit awkward because we do have a ton of triomes, but you know, Rakdos often does have slightly slight, you know, they don't kill us as quickly as aggro decks, for example, so as long as we just keep picking our land drops, we should be able to just cast whatever we draw off the top, and we do have a lot of, you know, Expressive Iteration is great in this matchup, Niv is obviously insane in the matchup, Crucius is really good in the matchup as well, so as long as we can keep playing lands, we should be good, so just want to make sure that we're getting all of the colours online. I might end up cycling some of these last triomes if, um, what am I saying? If we do end up flooding out a little bit, but I'm going to shock in the Watery Grave this turn just to put Giganther into our hand. Now, we could have passed with Helix up to be able to kill Crucius before they cast it, but, you know, I don't want to keep not u making use of the mana here, if that makes sense. But again, I could definitely see an argument to ho holding open Helix going into their Crucius turn. Okay, so it looks like opponent's missing land drops, which is obviously great for us, particularly with a hand like this where we don't have that much action going on. Oh, wow, lost legacy. I mean, I assume that's to take Niv out the deck, but I really don't think these sort of extraction effects are good against any deck that isn't a very all-in combo deck. Like, I think these sorts of extraction effects were good against Trap Finder because that deck was built so, so heavily around Ominous Traveler, but... You know, we've already got a Croxer in the graveyard here, which can win us the game on its own. We've still got Carvies in the deck. We've still got Crucius in the deck. So even though Niv is a, a light threat deck, and that is kind of a weakness of the deck, I definitely don't think extraction effects are the right way to go. Especially, you know, especially while we have... I guess when the opponent sideboarded, they didn't know that we'd have a Croxer in the graveyard, but... I'm going to play an untapped land here so that we can Helix and Cycler Triome in the in the same turn. Okay, Lilian is a little bit annoying. Thankfully, we can Helix it so that they can't mine us when we do escape the Croxer, but if they plus here, which they do, obviously, um, I think I'm going to cycle the Xander's Lands first just, first just to see what we find. Okay, Carvey's sick. We do just want to see as many threats as possible. And then, hmm, what to pitch here? I think I'm just going to pitch the Mana Confluence. 
And then we can Helix the Liliana so they can't minus it. And now we should have enough cards in the graveyard to be able to um, escape Croxa and play Carvu. Actually, thinking about it, I probably shouldn't have pitched the Mana Confluence last turn. I should have pitched the um, the Proving Ground instead. Yeah, that was my bad. That was a stupid misplay. I mean, thankfully, we didn't get punished for it because we drew a land off the top, but... Yeah, I definitely should have pitched the Proving Ground instead of the Confluence because had we not drawn an untapped land there, we wouldn't have been able to play Carvu and Croxer in the same turn, which seems pretty important here because now the opponent's in a tough spot where even if they have a fatal push, we should be able to kill the Liliana. So yeah, that was my bad. I was just playing too fast that last turn. Um, I guess I was thinking that, you know, I, I didn't expect to draw Carvu, so I'd already kind of made my mind up about what I wanted to discard. And I kind of wanted to keep the Proving Ground to cycle, but obviously having an untapped land was very important there to play both creatures. Okay, they do push the Croxa. So if they have a second push, that's going to be a bit rough, but we can still, you know, Liliana isn't very good against Croxa because they're going to just be filling up our graveyard. I think I'm going to pitch the, uh, the Proving Ground here just because I do want, you know... If they play any creature, Clarion not only um, kills their creature, but it also um, gives our creatures lifelink as well. And I assume if they had any removal for our creatures, that they would have used it last turn anyway. So I was pretty confident that Carvey's killing Liliana there. You know, if I, if I wasn't sure that Carvey was surviving, then I think pitching the Clarion is slightly better there, but... Since, you know, like I said, if if they had a removal, they probably would have used it before we untapped, so. Okay, they play Fable. Oh, okay, Iteration's a really nice draw here. Ha, huh, three lands, not what we want to see at this point in the game. I uh, guess we'll put Breeding Pool into hand, and then we can just play the Sacred Foundry tapped here. Going to attack first here. Uh, you know, at least we can pitch this land with uh, the Carvu. Ooh, okay. I mean, Drown in the Lock should be, be able to stop most of the stuff that they play at this point. And then we can play the Sacred Foundry Chapped. And, you know, one more card in the graveyard and we can escape the Crocs here. Now, I could Clarion now, but I kind of want to save it for when Reflection flips. Or if they play another creature, like if they play a Graveyard Trespasser, you know, saving Clarion for this turn enables us to kill both of them as well, which is nice. So they have got Fatal Push. I mean, we'll just counter that for sure. Now they've taken the Nivs out of the deck, we do want to protect our threats wherever we can. And now we can escape Croxer again. Ha, ah, okay, they do have Liliana, so I assume they minus here. Yeah, okay. And then they attack with the 2-2. Two -two. Ha, ah, Assassin's Trophy is interesting. So we'll definitely escape the Croxer here. And then, I mean, we could trophy the Liliana now, but I don't really feel that's worth it. You know, if they plus the Liliana, we can just pitch the Clarion. Then we can Clarion to kill the 2-2 two -two and the Reflection. And if they have a way to kill the Croc, so we can trophy in response. Ha, I mean, that's a pretty good top deck for the opponent, but... They obviously want to go for push before they plus the Liliana, so we can trophy now. Now, because we're not guaranteed to kill the Liliana anymore, right? If they hadn't drawn the push off the top, we can just Clarion, kill both their creatures, and then attack the Liliana. But since they push, we definitely want to kill the Liliana now while we have the chance. Ha, Carvey's another good draw for, me, for us, though. So now we can go for Clarion, and then play a Carvey. And now we've got four cards in the graveyard already, so, you know, all we need is two loots from the Carvey and be able, we'll be able to escape Croxer again. Okay, land is great to see. So we'll lead on attacking here and we'll discard the land to the Carvey here. Ha, ah, another land. So I think we we'll probably want to hold on to... We've already got enough lands in play. We're just going to hold on to this land to pitch to the Carvey next turn and then we can use it to escape the Croxer. Ah, Chandra, okay, so they have to plus and hope to hit a removal spell here. Okay, we should just win then, right? They play the Harvester, we can just Clarion and attack them for, for the win here. So even though we did misplay a couple of times in this game, I think, you know, thankfully they weren't huge misplays and we managed to get there. But yeah, overall, I feel like this matchup is definitely pretty favoured for the Niv deck, just because we have so many great top decks. I mean, opponent did stumble on mana, but that felt pretty good overall to me.
Okay, so we're going first here. And ha. Uh, I don't think we can keep this because so many of the cards in our hand are red and we don't have any red mana. Yikes. This is kind of awkward as well. I mean, on a six, I think I'm just going to keep this and risk it and hope to draw a red source. Like, this is the big problem with Niv, right? Sometimes you'll just have, you know, the right colours of mana. Sometimes you won't, you, but you have to keep hands like this. You know, this is why you need to be running 28 lands in the deck so that you can keep hands with this and you've got a relatively high chance of finding what you need. Okay, perfect. We got pretty lucky there. So opponent is on Selesnia Guildgate, so could be against the Gates deck potentially. I mean, if we can get Crucius in play, that does solve a lot of our issues, but this kind of highlights the issue I have with this deck where sometimes you're just going to have to mull, sometimes you don't find the right colours... And it can just be a bit awkward. So, going to get Crucius into play here. And I think... I think even though we haven't got our fourth land, I'm going to chew to the Niv because it's such high upside if we do end up drawing an untapped land off the top. If we don't, we can still use, you know, expressive iteration to find a land. We could still tutor a land off the Crucius by discarding the Helix, which I don't think will be that good in this matchup. Ha, huh, okay. They do have the Gatebreaker Ram. Okay, perfect. We do draw an untapped land off the top. So, again, another reason why... We want to be running 28 lands because we just need to keep hitting land drops like as we've seen here. Ha, huh, interesting. I think we just want the helix here. So now we can kill the gatebreaker round with double helix. Okay, having Crocs here as a card to discard to Crucius is great as well. I think I'm going to pick Lesser just to keep hitting lands. You know, if I didn't have the iteration in hand, then maybe. I'm not sure about that, but... Also, we need the set, you know, we, we we want double red, double black for Crocs. So I guess we already have double black, but we don't have the double red yet. So I think I'm happy to block here. The only thing we get blown up by is, oh, I was going to say is Growth Spiral, and they actually had it. Yikes. I was just thinking they would attack because they're happy making the trade with Niv, but yeah, that's a bit awkward. Huh, I mean... Now we're kind of in a weird position because... Oh, okay, sick. That's really good. I was going to say, now we're in a weird position because we, if we didn't block with Niv, our plan to kill the Gatebreaker round was just double Helix. I mean, we do have Assassin's Trophy, which does help. So I think we're just going to play the Carvu and I'll probably just Assassin's Trophy during the opponent's turn here. So now that we're not going to double Helix to kill the ram, you know, it, it would have been nice to save the, the Assassin's Trophy for... The, I can't remember the name of it, the three mana blue enchantment that draws them a bunch of cards or draws them, like, draws them cards whenever they play a gate. Uh, okay, that's a bit annoying because that does draw them cards. There's not really much we can do about that. I'm going to trophy now just in case they happen to be running counter spells in the main deck. I don't think that's very likely. But yeah, I mean. Even though losing Niv to the Gatebreaker round was annoying there, I don't think we can just let it start dealing us a bunch of damage. So, I don't know. Maybe that block was... Maybe we should have waited to see if they have the Growth Spiral first, but that's like the only card we got blown out by there, and they just happened to have it, which is a bit annoying. So I'm going to lead on attacking with the Carvey first just to loot and see what we hit here. We, I was, I was going to say, we didn't have a... Shockland or Triome that produces that the counts as a planes, so we couldn't make Carvu a five five. Oh wow, they're not trading with the with the Crasis. I'm very happy to see that. I mean, now we can just shock in the the Sacred Foundry, turn Carvu into five five, get Niv into play, refuel again. Okay, this is this is gas, and then we can just use Crucius to probably pitch the Triome at this point. Or I don't know. Actually, we probably want the land, and we don't need the second Crucius, so. I think we can just tutor up another Niv here, just in case, you know, the thing we're worried about them having here is Ugin. I think out of every deck in the format, Gates is probably the most likely deck to be playing Ugin. Okay, we can use Drown in the Luck to counter Gates Ablaze. So we get to save all of our creatures here, which is really nice, unless they happen to be running counter spells. Like, I'm honestly not sure what a, stocks, a, a stock Gates list looks like at the moment. You know, I've not played against this deck for a while. Okay, they just passed the turn back. So, I think I'll probably just lead on attacking here and loot with the Carvu. Again, we don't want to exile stuff from their graveyard because it turns Drown in the lock off slightly more. And I don't think we're going to, you know, Clarion's not going to be great in this matchup anyway. Plus, we already have Crucius in place, so we don't want to be killing that. 
Okay, no blocks for the opponent. They must have something or they probably would have put Gigantha into their hands. Okay, they Growth Spiral. And they play another gate. I mean, the nice thing about Assassin's Trophy in this matchup is that we can use it to kill Maze's end. You know, a lot of the time, Control has a really rough matchup against the Gates deck because you don't have any way to stop Maze's end. But thankfully, we do in this deck. Okay, interesting. I think, think I'll probably discard the Helix. Even though Helix can be used to deal the last few points of damage in a spot like this, I don't think we necessarily need that when we have, like, you know, two five fives, a 6-6, six, six, and a 3-3. Three, three. Plus, we have Drown in the Lock. Okay, yeah, we've got Drown in the Lock up to stop them sweeping our board anyway. So I think even without the Helix, we should be good to win here. Yeah, okay, nice. So Gates is an interesting matchup. I think we definitely want the Vetoes here to stop stuff like Ugin, to stop stuff like Gates Ablaze if we have creatures in play. Helix probably isn't going to do much because their only threat that it can kill is Arboreal Grazer, which we don't really care about at all. Tyrant Scorn is interesting because it kills Gatebreaker Ram. Uh, so we, again, same thing as Helix. We probably don't want the Clarions here. And then... I think Siphon Insight is just a generically decent card to have in this matchup since, you know, we're warding out Clarion and Helix. Tyrant Scorn is definitely better than Siphon Insight because Gatebreaker Ram does pose a problem if we don't have an answer to it. And then, yeah, Siphon Insight is just a nice card to bring in in these sorts of matchups as just a generically powerful card. You know, because, you know, there, there are going to be a decent number of cards in their deck that are kind of a whiff, but it's still going to be much more useful than something like uh, a Lightning Helix or a Deafening Clarion. Okay, so this hand isn't bad, you know. We can go uh, Hinterland Harbor into Godless Shrine and be able to cast everything in our hands. Wow, including th the Vito that we just drew. Okay, there's the Maze's End. Thankfully it comes in tapped, so they can't use uh, like Growth Spiral or Explore or anything. Okay, Thram Portal. Guild Summit, that's the name of the card I couldn't remember earlier. Yeah, thankfully, you know, the Vita off the top was a very good draw because that is a card that can snowball the game. I mean, thankfully we have Trophy for it. But, and we probably would have had to Trophy pretty much straight away because we didn't want to let them get value off it. And ramping a Maze's End deck isn't the best, but giving them uh, basics doesn't really help their game plan too much, so... Okay, so Tyrant Scorn coming in clutch here. Enables us to kill the Gatebreaker Ram and hold on to the trophy. Our oh, opponent just scoops it up. Okay, sick. Okay, so we're going second here. Okay, and we're against a Lurus deck. Interesting. Huh, I mean, I think... This is obviously really land heavy, but we do want to keep curving out, and Clarion could be potentially good against certain of certain Lurus decks. Ha, ah, okay. Looks like we're against Auras, which is kind of annoying. I mean, we do have a... You know, if we can draw a two-mana piece of interaction in the next turn, then we're pretty good. I'm going to play the Breeding Pool here because... Actually, I don't know. Maybe that's bad because if we draw Helix off the top, we can't play it anymore. But I do, you know... I want to set up so that we can play Carvu at worst. Oh, opponent plays... Interesting. Okay, so it's not Auras. It looks like it's... Um, not Affinity. I guess it's like the blue-white version of Thopters, basically. And the opponent kept a one-lander. Okay, so that's a lot better. I'm, I'm a lot more optimistic now. I, I, I felt like with my opening hand, Auras would have been very tough, but... As things stand, I actually... You know, especially, obviously, you know, it helps a lot the opponent stuck on one land, obviously, but I think I, I prefer my chances against uh, Affinity or Thopters or whatever you want to call this version of the deck. Okay, opponent's still missing land drops. So I think we're just going to put Gigantha into hands here because, you know, the only other thing we can do is Clarion and pay the one, but if the opponent does draw the second land and plays something like an Ingenious Smith, I would quite like to be able to Clarion. Or like, or, you know, if they don't play anything, we could go Niv into Clarion, you know, give it lifelink and attack, which should help stabilize a lot against them. So obviously, you know, them keeping a one lander and not drawing the second land is a huge help, but 
I still feel like this matchup overall should be quite good for Niv, especially post Cyborg when we've got Culling Ritual. And I have been considering, you know, I'm only running two Culling Ritual at the moment, but I was definitely considering going up to three. I definitely think that could be a card that, go that you know, particularly if you expect to face a lot of Thopters or Affinity or Auras, I think, you know, Culling Ritual is just the best card in all of those matchups. So maybe that's something I should look into. I'm not exactly sure what I would cut for it. Ma to be honest, maybe you don't need four Siphon Insight in the sideboard, so... I could maybe see... Okay, I've got to discard some cards. Definitely going to discard the Croxa. I don't think we need all three of these lands. Uh, so you can probably pitch the Blood Crypt. And Drown in the Lock. Actually, wait, no, no, we should have kept... Yeah, that was that was my bad. I should have kept the Blood Crypt so that we have the second red to escape the Croxer. I mean, to be honest, with, with Niv and a Gigantha in hand, I don't think escaping Croxer is the priority, but yeah, I definitely should have kept the Blood Crypt over one of the other cards. Okay, they did draw their second line, and they fragment reality into Portable Hole, which isn't too bad. I think we're just, you know... We could slam Niv here, but we've already got a very full hand, so I feel like that's kind of a waste. We just have to discard the hand size, so... Instead, I'm just going to play Gigantha out here, and then that should just unlock a ton of mana for next turn, so that even if they have Metallic Rebuke, we could cast Niv, and then, you know, potentially cast Deafening Clarion and pay for two. Ha, okay, they've got Ornithopter and the Foundry, so they can obviously make a 4-4 here, so just going to tap the Gigantha to, to play the Niv here, and we'll see what we hit. Ah, uh, opponent just scoops it up. So, I mean, obviously... Really helped they got stuck on one land here. But overall, I think this matchup should be pretty good. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, thinking about it, I think I do quite like the idea of three culling rituals. So one change that I might want to make after this event is going up to three culling ritual and just trimming on a siphon in sight. Because I don't mind, you know, keeping in one helix against control should be fine. Okay, so what do we want to cut here? I mean, Tyrant Scorn seems good against the 4-4s four from Retrofit of Foundry, where Helix isn't that great. So maybe we just do a straight swap out here, you know. Actually, wait, no, no, we should be keeping Coligan's Command in what we're doing. Yeah, sorry. So Coligan's Command, definitely really good against the Artifact deck, obviously. Just trying to think whether Helix is better than Drown in the Lock. I might just cut the Drown in the Lock. I mean, all their stuff is pretty cheap, so as long as we can start filling up their Graveyard Drown should be pretty reasonable, but... I do also like Helix as just a way to buffer our life total once we have stabilized a little bit. And, you know, being able to kill Ingenious Smith and Esper Sentinel seems quite important. I mean, maybe keeping Drown in the Lock in is slightly better. Maybe I should have kept in at least one copy of Drown in the Lock, but it's a really awkward card if you have it in your opening hand. You know, I would much rather have Helix than Drown in the Lock in the early game. Okay, opponent just plays Island and Pass. So we definitely want to be able to play Carvey next turn. So I'm going to lead on the, the, the Triome here, and then we can cast Carvey as a 5-5 five five straight away, which seems pretty sick. Okay, opponent just plays Ornithopter and an Ingenious Smith. I mean, they definitely should have done that the other way around. Because they just missed out on getting an extra counter on the Ingenious Smith. Either way, we'll just run out of the Carvey here. Entering on turn 2 as a 5-5 five five is so sick when you can do that. So unfortunately, they do have the Foundry, you know, we could have potentially held open Helix to kill the Thopter to stop them getting the 4-4, but I feel like getting Carvu into play earlier is generally better. I mean, maybe not because this then also enables them to get an extra counter on the Ingenious Smith. I mean, either way, we've obviously missed the window to kill the Thopter now. So I think we're just going to run out Carvu again. Now, they could have Metallic Rebuke, but can't play around everything. Okay. So it doesn't look like they do... So they do make a 4-4, and that does put Ingenious Smith up to a 3-3 as well. I mean, thankfully, we do have the Tyrant Scorn as a way to kill the Ingenious Smith. And the Carvu is always going to outscale their 4-4. But yeah, looking back, maybe it would have been better to kill to just hold up Helix, because we knew they did have the Foundry, but I just felt like the 4-4 wouldn't really matter as long as we had the, the Carvu in play. Ha, ah, okay, they fragment the Carvu. So that's not great for us, obviously. Um, and they just passed the turn. Okay, interesting. 
So this is kind of rough. We definitely want to kill the Ingenious Smith, and I really don't want to give them a draw of Esper Sentinel. You know, we could shock in the, the Breeding Pool and kill the 4-4 and the Ingenious Smith, but we'd have to give them a card. So I think I'm just going to pass to their upkeep. Tyrant score on the Ingenious Smith. We take five down to three, and then next turn we can... Okay, so they tap out here. Now they're tapped out, we don't have to worry about... Um, What's it called? Metallic Rebuke. We can... Yeah, I'll fire off the Tyrant Scorn then. So now we take six down to two. Huh, maybe it was better to shock in the, the Breeding Pool and play both Tyrant Scorns there, to be honest. Ah, okay. We're dead to Machiko, so it didn't end up mattering, but... Even if they didn't have the Machiko's Reign of Truth there, maybe it would have been better to shock in the, the Breeding Pool and go for the Tyrant Scorn. Either way, I think I'm happy to run it back. Oh, uh, maybe I should have brought in one drown in the lock, but like I said, it is very awkward in your opener, so But yeah, thinking about it, this is the sort of matchup where I you know, it doesn't feel the easiest matchup. And uh culling ritual is just by far and away the best card in our deck, so considering it's good here and against regular affinity and against red white thopters and against auras, not to mention, you know, you could bring it in against wizards as well. I could definitely see an argument to going up uh, an extra culling ritual in the sideboard. So this is a hand that I definitely wouldn't keep if I was going second. But on the play, I don't mind it. You know, we've got Niv. We've got enough lands to almost certainly have Niv on curve. And we've got Kurligan's Command, which can often kill two of their permanents. So even if they have a fast start, you know, if they go like Ingenious Smith and an Artifact, we could use Kurligan's Command to kill both, which is pretty nice. Oh, wow, okay. That's a great top deck. I think we're just slamming Carvey on turn two here. And it's entering as a 4-4, which is nice. And then if they do portable hold it, we've got Colligan's Command as an answer. Okay, they do have the portable hole. Let's see if they got anything else here. Okay, and a retrofit a foundry. Oh, and a thop to yikes. So... This isn't super clear cut here, what we should do. Okay, drawing Tyrant Scorn is nice. I was going to say, I'm not sure whether we want to kill the Foundry, the 4-4, or the Portable Hole, but drawing the Tyrant Scorn is pretty nice here because now we can kill the 4-4, and then if they play another creature... Oh, wait, we've got to wait for the 4-4 to come into play. So yeah, we kill the 4-4 now. Do, do it during our end step before they have uh, Mana for Metallic Rebuke. And then, if they play a creature here... Okay, perfect. They play an Ingenious Smith. So now we can use the Kurligan's Command to kill the Ingenious Smith and either kill the Foundry or the Portable Hole. Since they whiffed off the Ingenious Smith, I think I'm just more interested in getting the Carvey back. If they'd hit, like, a, an Ornithopter or something, then killing the Foundry is a priority then, but since they don't have any Thopters that we're aware of... I think getting Carvey is better, especially because we still haven't found the fifth land yet. And Carvey attacking can loot a way to help us find the fifth land. Oh, they just scoop it up. Okay, sick. So nice, we got there. So we ended up going 4-1 in this event. The one loss that I'm probably not going to put, because um, it was just boring, was basically a match against uh, Gruul Midrange, where I mulliganed to 5 game 1 and just didn't find red. And then the second uh, game, I just mulled to 5 and never found my third land. So the only loss in this, this event was to the mana base, basically, which isn't a huge surprise, but... So when the deck cooperates, it's great. When the mana base doesn't, it's obviously not ideal. Okay, so what do we think of the deck overall then? Well, I mean, in that event, we managed to go 4-1. And unsurprisingly, the one loss was basically just to the mana base. Like I said, we're against a Gruul midrange deck where game one, I had to mulligan a couple of times and basically just keep a risky hand where I had to draw red mana and just never found it. And then game two, I just didn't find my third land. So that's the issue with this deck. When the mana base cooperates, the deck feels really, really sick. But, you know, every five or six matches, you're just going to have this situation where the mana base just doesn't cooperate. And in terms of consistency, I think that's what's really holding the deck back overall. Uh, additionally, I do think how good this deck is definitely depends on how popular aggro is because stumbling on the mana base a little bit early isn't that bad if the opponent isn't running a very fast deck. You know, aggro decks like Wizards, like Burn, like Humans really punishes those starts where you stumble. And so if aggro isn't super popular, 
Even with the inconsistent mana base, I think that this is a good choice, but if aggro is very popular, particularly a deck like humans where they have Esper Sentinel and Thalia to tax your stuff, then it becomes a little bit more risky. Uh, in terms of the card selection, you know, like I said, the mana base is the big issue, but... I think we're utilizing all of the lands that we have available in Historic pretty well. You know, the only upgrade I can think of is if they decided to print, like, the, the OG fetch lands into Historic, which I don't see happening anytime soon. Uh, in terms of the card selection, I think the main deck felt great. The only uh, change that I'm tempted to make from the sideboard is just trimming a Siphon Insight and putting a third Culling Ritual into the sideboard because... There are, you know, I think the matchups against Affinity, against Thopters, and against Auras are quite close, and Culling Ritual is like our, the, well, just the best card in those matchups. So I like going up to three. I wouldn't want to go up to four just because it is a four mana card. You don't want to be running too many of them. And it does interfere with Crucius finding Niv, but in the matchups where you want this, it's actually kind of a benefit to be able to tutor this up anyway. So overall, I think the deck is really sick. I think it has a lot of potential. Unfortunately, unfortunately, since the big issue with this deck is the inconsistency from the mana base, I'm not really sure there's a good solution to that. So I think this deck will be a good choice if aggro isn't very popular. You know, if the, if the deck, if the format becomes much more mid-range focused, then I think this is a great choice. If there is a way that I could improve the mana base, or a way that you can think of that can improve the consistency in the mana base, definitely let me know in the comments, because that's the main thing holding it back. And overall, I think the deck is pretty well built as it is, so I'm going to leave the importable deck list in the description if you want to try it out for yourself. But yeah, I think this is a good choice if aggro isn't very popular and if it is then i think it's just like a tier two deck because of the inconsistency in the mana base anyway like i said if you've got any questions or suggestions for the deck definitely let me know in the comments and i'll catch you on the next video big up